Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that all of us currently are on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. The University of Minnesota is located on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. And the IAS acknowledges that this place has a complex and layered history. And this land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and with each other. The IAS is committed to ongoing efforts to advocate, recognize, and support American Indian nations and peoples. Uh, first, a couple of little Zoom housekeeping things. I'm sure everybody's getting used to Zoom, but uh, this is technically a Zoom webinar. And so would you please enter any questions you have, not in the chat, but in the little um, double balloons labeled Q&A. And at the end of this, uh, at the end of um, our speaker's presentation, then we will be reading those questions to her to be able to answer. I should also just note that this is being recorded and will be available on the IAS YouTube channel later. Uh, one quick announcement, um, interdisciplinary doctoral fellowships are due uh, next Monday, October 19th, and fellows applications are due uh, November 9th. And we'll see you again next week at the same time, same place. You need to register again uh, for Dr. Valerie Hudson, the first who will be talking about the first political order, how sex shapes governance and national security worldwide. So it's my very great pleasure that the IAS is co-sponsoring with one of our research and creative collaboratives today, um, our collaborative on preparing our future museums, museum studies in the 21st century. And our speaker is Elizabeth Merritt, who is the founding director of the Center for the Future of Museums. She is the American Alliance of Museums Vice President for Strategic Foresight, and found, and, as well as the founding director of the Center for the Future of Museums, which is a think tank and research and development lab for the entire museum field. She studied ecology evol and evolution as an undergraduate at Yale and received her master's in cell and molecular biology from Duke University. Her museum career has included working in a children's museum, a natural history, and other history muse museums. Um, uh, Elizabeth is a graduate of the Getty Leadership Institute's Museum Management Program. And prior to, study, uh, to starting the Center for the Future of Museums, Elizabeth wrote the book on museum standards and best practices as director of the American Alliance's Accreditation and Excellence Programs. This was sort of ideal preparation for her current role as agent provocateur challenging museums to question assumptions about traditional practice and to experiment with new ways of doing business. Elizabeth is the author of the Alliance's annual Trends Watch report. And if you notice the slides at the beginning, you saw uh, um, the cover of that and works with museums around the world to help them build a better tomorrow. So without further ado, Elizabeth Merritt. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jennifer. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a Prezi presentation lined up for you. There we go, ready to start. Well, as Jennifer told you, I am a futurist. And I'm going to talk to you today about forecasting the financial future of museums. However, I want to start by clarifying that as a futurist, I don't actually predict the future. Many people think I do. So I wanted to start by clarifying that difference. Predictions say this is what's going to happen. So for example, there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, said that in 1943, and as this demonstrates, predictions are often wrong. 
More to the point, when it comes to planning, predictions are often harmful, whether they're right or wrong, because they make you think you can plan around one certain outcome. What I do as a futurist is forecasting. And forecasting, by contrast, is the art of exploring a range of plausible futures that could emerge. So forecasting doesn't say this will happen, it asks what if. So for example, what if everyone in the world had a computer in their pocket? And I bet if IBM had asked themselves that question back in 1943, they'd be feeling very good about themselves right now. Foresight encourages people to examine all of the available data, what's going on in the world around you, apply your imagination, and envision different ways the world could turn out. That lets you create resilient strategies in your planning. So in planning, foresight helps you expand your vision, identify your assumptions, question them, think about what else could happen, imagine possibilities for the kind of world that could create, widen the pool of choices you might consider in making your plans. Very importantly, envision a preferred future. Think in a very intentional way about where you would like to be and then identify what you can do to try and steer events in that direction because you aren't powerless in the face of the forces shaping the world. You are an agent of change. And that empowerment is very important, especially in a year like this, because it may combat the feeling of helplessness we may feel in a time of catastrophe, because it lets us know there are things we can do. So if I had to shorthand it, I'd say my job as a futurist is to help people see the world differently. I help them think about what happened in the past, look at what's happening now, and then use that as a jumping off point for what could happen in the future. One of the ways I support this kind of thinking is through the forecasting report that Jennifer mentioned, but I read each year for the Alliance, Trends Watch, that every year applies this kind of approach to four or five topic areas, but actually this year, 2020, Trends Watch happened to be a deep dive into one topic, the future of financial sustainability. I was writing this back in 2019, and my colleagues and I chose this topic because we knew it's crucial to museums at the best of times, and actually it turned out to be unfortunately apt timing because now in a COVID-induced financial crisis, it's more important than ever to understand how museums have made money and then think about how they might have to change their operations in the future. So, with a thank you to the sponsor of this year's report, and that would be Blackbaud and Huntington T. Block Insurance. Uh, I'm going to use that report as a jumping off point for the next step. How do we think about the financial future of museums in light of the pandemic and the current financial crisis? Now remember, foresight starts by looking backwards. So let's think about how museums historically, and by that I mean as recently as the last few years, have made the money that they need to operate. Usually this is a um, combination of four accounting categories, earned revenue, that's ticket revenue, catering, facilities, rental, programming, contract services, charitable contributions, the majority of which come from individuals, increasingly from a small number of very wealthy individuals, but also includes foundation funding, government funding, most of which comes from state and local governments, just a little bit from the federal government, but we appreciate that, and then financial capital, investment income, often from money set aside and donor restricted or board restricted endowments that are devoted to particular purposes. So that is how an accountant looks at a museum's income. That's how museums report their income, for example, on their 990s to the IRS. Of course, this differs among different kinds of museums. The mix differs. Uh, here is a bar chart that shows you sources of revenue by museum type. And you'll notice, for example, that um, art museums and sculpture gardens have a relatively high percentage of their income from the draw on their endowment, 16%. But if you look at, oh, science or technology centers or children's museums, they're only getting 2% of their income from their endowments, often because they have much smaller endowments, in part because they're smaller institutions and in part because they don't attract that kind of donations. 
That has made them very vulnerable in the current crisis because their earned income, which is relatively low, uh, sorry, which is relatively high as a proportion of their total support has crashed and they don't have as much buffer. What I want you to think about today, however, is beyond accounting. When we envision the financial future, please consider money isn't neutral. Where a museum gets its money to operate is going to influence its behavior. And I want to spend a couple minutes looking at income streams from that point of view, mapping money from the motivation that spurs someone to hand over cash to a museum, and then the influence that can exert on how the museum then behaves. So for the first motivation, let's talk about what I call transactional income. That is when very capitalist system, somebody pays a vendor what they feel is a fair amount of money for goods. So I'm gonna hand over my credit card, buy this very nice pair of red high heeled shoes and I feel like I got fair value for money. Now this kind of capitalist transaction has some, um, has some benefits. For one thing, it gives you accurate and immediate feedback about whether you are providing something that people want to buy. If they're going to hand over their hard-earned cash, they obviously think it was worth it. On the other hand, it opens you up to competition. Uh, anything that you can sell, other things that are for profits can sell as well and without the added burden of unfunded mandates like education or collections care. It also may push the museum to cater to mainstream tastes. Are you really gonna take a chance on a small niche exhibit that might be very scholarly and interesting, but won't attract a lot of people who will pay admission? Another motivation for handing over money to museums is philanthropic. And instead of a linear transaction between me and you, me giving you cash for something of value, philanthropy creates a triangle. An individual or an organization is willing to pay the museum to provide a product or service that they believe will benefit a third party. And as an example, I'm going to bring up an early philanthropist, Andrew Carnegie, who is at one point the wealthiest man in the world, and he gave $60 million to fund a system of almost 1,700 public libraries across the US. And he famously said, surplus wealth is a sacred trust which its possessor is bound to administer in his lifetime for the good of the community. So philanthropy provides an epic economic model for funding goods and services for people who might not be able to afford them. So it offers the potential of evening out those inequalities. However, and this is a big but, it creates a disconnect between the funder and the user. And there's a growing criticism of philanthropy as people question whether funders really understand and represent the needs of the people their funding purports to serve. Carnegie's a really good case in point. He had very strong opinions about what books should be in those libraries for the improvement and betterment of the working class. And even in his time, William Jewett Tucker, who was the future president of Dartmouth College, critiqued Carnegie saying, a society could make no greater mistake than asking charity to do the work of social justice. In our times, the, the uh, equivalent of that criticism is calls to decolonize philanthropy and thought leaders like Edgar Villanueva, who's pictured here, he's an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, is calling on foundations to listen to their communities and let people with the needs tell them how the money should be distributed rather than taking a top-down closed-door approach to charity. In other words, don't decide what we need, just give us the money. Then there's what I like to call relational income. Relational business models depend on a organization being embedded in and responsive to their community. They contain elements of both transactional a direct connection between the provider and the purchaser, and philanthropic, wanting to support the organization for what it does. Relational economies are complicated. So here's a picture of my favorite neighborhood bookstore, Politics and Prose. It's about five blocks away. It's a good example because many independent booksellers survive because readers value them as local businesses over and above the fact that they sell books. When DC and Virginia locked down last spring with COVID, I knew I'd need some reading and I could have ordered books from Amazon. 
and I would have gotten them cheaper and I would have gotten them next day delivery. But instead I ordered them online from PNP. It took three weeks for them to arrive. I had to pick them up in the back parking lot wearing a mask. They cost more, but it was worth it because I want PNP to be there to reopen again when the pandemic's over. It's not just a source of books, it's a neighborhood anchor where I can hear talks, I meet people, I socialize, it's part of my everyday life. So normally we think of this kind of support. I was willing to give up my time, I was giving, willing to give up some of the money I could have saved as being something that people give nonprofits, but I would contend that it's really about how people feel about an organization, not its tax exempt status that earns this kind of support. Relational income is a mix of emotion plus value. Well, whatever rate framework you use to examine income, whether it's accounting categories, whether it's motivational categories, the overarching lesson is as museums reopen and rebuild, I want you to think about what you want that museum to be, because where a museum finds its money is gonna shape what it becomes. Now, with that overview of the past, let's look what's happening now and forecast a few ways that things could evolve in the future. Today's exploration is gonna take the form of four brief scenarios of how the world may play out in the next couple of years and how museums could operate in each set of circumstances. Scenarios are what futurists call stories that we write to think about different ways the future might Play out. So based in fact in history, we use our imagination to envision plausible ways that things could happen. It deepens and expands our thinking by creating fictions that could plausibly come true. The four fictions we're going to look at today are one that I call growth, in which the economy rebounds and we resume life more or less as usual. One called collapse, in which we don't manage the current crisis well and things continue to unravel. A future of constraint in which society rebuilds but creates self-imposed limits to that growth. And finally, transformation. I'm going to introduce a one story illustrating a possible sideways leap that is, would result in a significantly different operating system from museums. Now keep in mind, these stories are not mutually exclusive. Almost certainly, certain elements from each of them is going to actually inform the future we live in, and different museums may actually find themselves living in different futures out of this set. But each of these four stories foregrounds major elements that museums can use in their planning. So let's look at the first story, which is one of growth, or as I have said it here, regrowth, since we're trying to get back to at least the situation we were in before the pandemic hit. And I have entitled this little story, Back to Business as Usual. In this future, museums that hunker down and survive the next two years reopen and relaunch with the goal of recovering what they were before that pandemic hit. Now, remember that traditional income mix? Maybe they're gonna try and shoot for that again. Sure, things will be different, at least in the short run. There are going to be adaptations like requiring staff and visitors to wear masks. There's going to be performative cleaning so you can see that surfaces are wiped down and social distancing prompts. But overall, the museum and its operations stay mostly the same. In terms of their income mix, Museums continue to rely on a traditional source of uh, income sources, but with an increasing awareness of how fragile this business model is. Now remember, we've gone through two events in a decade that gutted all four of those income streams, the financial collapse provoked by the mortgage loan crisis in 2008, and now the pandemic. So in this business as usual scenario, the major takeaway is that museums are gonna have to be hyper efficient they're gonna to have to be really good at getting money out of whatever it is they do. They're gonna to have to operate at peak, peak performance. They're gonna to have to prom concentrate on being what I would call very profitable nonprofits. So for example, they're gonna to have to pursue the holy grail of monetizing digital. One of the things you've seen museums do really well during the pandemic is reaching the public through digital content. So for example, live stream commentary from a curator at the Frick Museum, which pairs it with a recommended cocktail. Uh, by the way, the curator here recommended Polish vodka to go with Rembrandt's Polish writer. Museums crushed it on content. 
but almost all of this content was free. So it's not doing much of anything to make up for the lost income. Now, some museums are figuring out ways to monetize this. So for example, uh, the Oakland Zoo is providing a subscription channel for some of their marvelous content, and they're using it as an opportunity to solicit donations as well. So in this scenario, museums may be more focused on attaching earned or contributed revenue to their digital products and services. Now, one of the practices I discussed in this year's Trends Watch is very relevant to this scenario because, for example, as they reopen, museums have to limit attendance, either voluntarily or because it's mandated by local government. Timed ticketing is pre-adapted to a practice called buy-ahead pricing, in which museums use data to create a variety of pricing schemes tied to um, projected attendance. So, for example, the Indianapolis Zoo uses several years of data about attendance and weather and school schedules to project what the attendance will be on any given day and then they offer prices depending on demand so high demand popular times will charge more and if they're trying to steer people towards um, less populated times they'll put a lower price on them also side note as an equity issue it seems fair that those who can pay more should pay more while people who need to economize can have affordable options Another area museums may need to focus on is data analytics, aggressively using data collection and algorithms that are designed to drive attendance or membership or sales or other performance. One example I highlight in Trends Watch is the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. They use data from their e-commerce platform to create targeted marketed campaigns by working with a data insights company called DigiWorks to identify offerings likely to ap appeal to existing buyers, and then they used A-B testing to refine their content and messaging. So like they'll test some, whether this way of wording a recommendation, recommending something would get more sales versus another way of doing it. So the resulting algorithm combines demographic data about a new customer with historical data from other customers to create tailored recommendations for subsequent purchases. You know, since you bought this, you might like that. Very familiar, familiar pattern from you know, Amazon or Netflix. And as a result, they increased the number of second time purchasers by 150% and revenue by nearly 50% over the previous year when they introduced it. That's being an efficient for profit, nonprofit. Okay. Well, let's look at a Another scenario that's a little darker, a future of collapse, I've entitled this one survival mode. It's all too easy actually to imagine a dystopian scenario like this, uh, given that we're hearing projections that we may face up to two more years of COVID-19 before things really get back to normal. I've even seen projections of up to five years. Depressing, we can talk about that after the talk if you like. There's also going to be huge hits to local business. A poll by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and MetLife in early April revealed that one in four small businesses thought they were less than two months away from closing permanently. And of course, that was months ago. Um, only, at that time, only one in 10, uh, sorry, one in 10 thought they were less than one month away from permanently going out of business. And I don't know about you, but in my neighborhood, I am seeing a growing number of shuttered and empty store fronts. We're also facing grim prospects about employment and the economy. Uh, in many states, a quarter of the workforce is currently unemployed. And projections for unemployment um, up in the double digits are being thrown about through 2021. And all of this means that the tax base for cities and states is going to collapse, which is going to cripple government funding. So in this future, we might see a situation in which a large number of museums close permanently. I've seen ranges in the uh, estimates in the ranges of seven to 30 percent of museums in the U.S. That's another thing we can discuss later. The remaining museums are going to have significantly reduced financial reserves because they would have pulled down their savings in order to support their staff and their core operations while they were closed. The sheer number of museum people who are out of work is going to further depress salaries as people compete to underbid each other for the remaining jobs. And there's a very real chance that museums could shed parts of their operations like education or research or object conservation that cost money but don't bring in income, except to the extent that they're underwritten by restrictive endowments or new philanthropy. 
There's an infamous quote from the Museum of Modern Art you might have seen from back in April when they announced they were terminating all of their educator contracts. Someone announced to the press, it will be months, if not years, before we anticipate returning to budget and operation levels that require educator services. That's a chilling prospect. So what is the economic model for museums in a story of collapse? Well, in a severely stressed economy, museums will have to get money where there is still money. And in an age that's already marked by extreme wealth inequality, one of the remaining sources of funds is going to be relying on big donors. We already live in a society where 68% of charitable dollars come from individuals, and 20 to 30% of that individual giving in the US comes from people with a net worth of over $30 million. So them as have are going to be the ones who get asked. Now notice one of the side effects of this is going to be museums who had been spending a little more attention on the ethics and reputation of the people and companies funding them might not be able to afford that kind of choosiness. Um, they're going to have to pay more attention to who's willing to give money and perhaps not as much um, attention to how they made that money. Another source of information uh, of Another source of continued funding could be foundations. Um, right now, there's some angst and wrestling over whether foundations should actually be reaching into the principle of their endowments and spending them down to support the arts in a crisis like this. But they have money to give, and many of them are loosening up the restrictions on their grants to allow people more flexibility in funding. Um, there was uh, a Council of Foundations pledge earlier this year that 744 foundations signed, saying that they would support their nonprofits and their communities by loosening restrictions on grants in other ways. And then the other thing is, even though many small businesses are going under, a lot of big companies are making lots of money and continue to prosper. So again, museums might be going back to big Sponsors like banks or um, tech companies or insurance or utilities and saying, can you give us money? Same comment here as I had on big donors. There had been more pushback for museums to consider whether they ought to take money from, example, big oil because of concerns about climate change. But if that's who has the money, you might have a choice between taking the money or out of business. The next story I'm going to tell is one of constraint. So a constraint scenario is, is a classic scenario in a futurist set, and it chooses some kind of limit to growth to shape the story. And in this case, the story, which I'm calling interdependence, is focusing on the fact that we've learned from the pandemic how vulnerable our economic system is. Our crucial systems like food and transportation and care and city services depend on the exploitation of vulnerable communities. And as we've learned, you can't redline a pandemic. In this future, the US may decide to constrain itself in terms of profitability by focusing on mutual aid and stability through promoting equity and reducing economic inequality focusing less on efficiency and more on resilience. So in this future, we as a country might choose to, for example, institute a universal basic income that would mitigate some of the effects of unemployment during the pandemic. Adopt universal health care uncoupled from employment to try and ward off the worst effects that a pandemic can have on a poorly insured workplace. Raise wage standards for essential workers and pivot away from privatization and back towards robust public funding of shared public services like transportation and education and healthcare and public colleges. In the museum sector, this might manifest as museums as creators of individual and community wealth who play an active and intentional role in growing local businesses. So for example, here's a real signal of change. Um, at the National Public Housing Museum in Chicago, they're planning an entrepreneurship hub that will help public housing residents start their own businesses and market their products. 
part of museums role in strengthening local business, uh, sorry, strengthening local economies in this story might be prioritizing the creation of good, decently paid jobs with good benefits, not only to support museum workers overall, but to create a stable, thriving economy. Museums have long focused on education, and they're already beginning to explore how they could expand their role in community health, both mental and physical. Here's a signal of how that could happen. Two years ago, physicians who are members of Médecins Francophones du Canada started prescribing visits to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts as a supplement to conventional treatment. These prescriptions enable patients in, accompanied by a family or caregivers to enjoy the health benefits of art on a free visit to the museum. So what's the economic model for museums in this constraint scenario? Well, museums are seen as public goods and as public goods, they might receive significant fu government funding, more like the European model. As providers of essential health services, they might receive income from insurance, private or government, because it's less expensive to pay museums to promote well-being than to treat preventable illness. And finally, I think that as museums prioritize their roles as creators of equitable and individual and community wealth, they'll cultivate the robust relational support from community individuals and businesses that will ensure that they have members, purchasers, and supporters. All right, I promise to throw you a curveball. Here is a story of transformation. Now, transformation scenarios explore sideways leaps. They explore discontinuities in practice. There should shake up your thinking and lead you to question your assumptions. So I've chosen a transformation about the foundation of museum, museum labor and economics. I call it citizen museology. In this story, the economic future has looked at changing the model of expenditures rather than income. In a future with mass unemployment or underemployment, that is, however, alleviated by robust public assistance, such as a universal basic income, there may be people looking for personal fulfillment by donating their time to an endeavor that gives them purpose, that makes them feel like they're doing something worthwhile. We've already seen the growth in the past decade of volunteer scholarship and engagement, so citizen science and citizen history. So in this future, we might say, see the rise of citizen museology in which we see a mass deprofessionalization of the sector. Museums lower costs by reducing or eliminating paid labor, which makes it easier for them to serve people with free products and services, and also makes them less vulnerable to economic downturns. And the money that the museum does spend on salaries can go to providing good wages for essential frontline workers like security guards and maintenance and cleaning staff. Well, Setting aside the fact that most of us would like paid jobs in museums, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of this model? To the best of my knowledge, the current museum volunteer corps skews white, wealthy and well-educated, just like museum visitors. But arguably, that's in part reflecting the demographics of who is able to volunteer based on income and transportation and the specifics of volunteer opportunities. That inequality might even out in a future in which we've built a robust support system for people to pursue their passions, whether or not that passion aligns with a conventional paying job. On the other hand, on the plus side, a museum staffed by a robust and diverse volunteer corps representing the community in which they live might be very plugged into the needs of that community and better able to serve its needs. All of these scenarios offer some upsides. In regrowth, museums become more savvy about building income streams, about things we already do well. In collapse, as museums gradually repilled, the field will have the opportunity to recruit a cadre of staff that is more racially and culturally inclusive. In interdependence, as museums are integrated into the operations of American society and no longer struggling to provide their, to prove their relevance, they are seen as essential services. And in transformation, museums take on a different kind of relevance, becoming the people's museum, more like a food co-op than a grocery store, to use an analogy, where people find individual meaning and fulfillment through volunteerism. So that said, income isn't destiny. 
If a museum wants to center a particular value in its core, it can always find a way to tweak the economic model it has to try and foreground that priority. So for example, if a museum wants to prioritize equity and accessibility, a museum dependent on earned income could use variable pricing to charge people with means as much as they're willing to pay and use those funds to provide free admission to those who can't pay. A museum dependent on wealthy donors, foundations, or companies could seek out people or organizations whose values are consonant on their own, even if that means being a smaller museum. Museums dependent on government funding can influence policy and government budgets by helping to create an informed citizenry and motivate them to vote. And museums dependent on volunteer labor can assess the overt and subtle barriers that might exclude people from volunteering by race or class. The key is for a museum to ask first, what do we want to be? And then ask, how will we pay for it? Preferably in a way directly linked to that identity. The takeaway, I hope, is to encourage you not to think about just surviving in this difficult time, but to take some time to dream about a better world that we can create and to think about practical steps to get there. For museums, that means taking the time to think about the values we want to reflect in our world and how to build financial models that align with those values. Well, if you want to explore these thoughts in more depth, here's how to find my work. Uh, the American Alliance of Museums on the web, and a direct link to the Center for the Future of Museums content with a bit.ly short link there. Also, you can find CFM content on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest under the um, name of Future of Museums. There we go. Those are some thoughts for us to talk over in our discussion time. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your talk. And um, I'm going to turn the program over to Lynn Nelson Mason, who's one of the co conveners of the collaborative, to manage the questions. And I encourage all of you to type your questions into the QA box. Great. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I'm Lynn Nelson Mason. I'm the director of the Goldstein Museum of Design here at the University of Minnesota. And I'm also the uh, Director of Graduate Studies for the University's Museum Studies Program and one of the co-conveners of the IAS Collaborative as the co-sponsor of today's talk. Thanks so much uh, to attendees for putting your um, questions in the, uh, in the Q&A box. Our first question comes from Holly Menninger and she says, with respect to monetizing digital programs, how successful do you think that model will be in light of the fact that so many museums and other cultural institutions produce so much free content, particularly in the first months of the pandemic, and continue to do so now. Will audience yes. really be willing to pay? Yes, this is a very good question. It's excellent. Thank you for it. Let me try and organize my thoughts. First of all, you've nailed it. It's very hard to sell something in an environment where everybody's giving away something that looks similar for free. And as a side note, this is one of the potentially damaging side effects of philanthropy. It's great that philanthropy underwrites so many great products by museums, but they're effectively removing the ability of other museums who don't have that operating, that underwriting, to do the same thing except charge a fair price for it. So it's a messed up system. However, I think what we've learned is that people are willing to pay for content. How many of you, if I were in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hands. How many of you pay for a streaming subscription from Hulu or Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever? And it's a large percentage of the public. Even though there is a ton of free content out there on YouTube and, and people's personal channels, because it's high quality content. And that's one of the keys, is museums that produce unique, high quality content can charge for it. Uh, as an example, um, here are a couple of museums that have built content channels and are earning money from them. The National Baseball Hall of Fame has created a, a La Vida Baseball, which is a um, media company that reaches out to um, Latino baseball fans, and there are a lot of them, 
with high quality content on a subscription and um, underwriting basis and it's making good money for the museum. Another one is Corning Museum of Glass. So they had already had a wonderful YouTube channel and a few years ago they began saying, well, you know, are we willing to take advertising on this? Are we willing to monetize it this way? And they said, yeah, we're willing to do this. And they had built up a large enough subscription base that they qualified for YouTube's program that would let them earn money through subscriptions and advertising. So they jumped in. And now they're expecting to earn six figures of income in 2020. They have one and a half staff dedicated to managing the channel and that could be very profitable. But I think both those examples demonstrate that it's not just that you can throw stuff out and people are gonna pay for it as one-offs. It's a conscious process of building high quality content and devoting resources to managing it thoughtfully to build a real stable income stream. Great, thank you. Uh, Will Hagen um, asked, equity and, equity and accessibility goals could be supported by power sharing, allowing more people from the community to determine what programs and spending occurs, particularly in the transformation scenario. Would you like to comment? Uh, I would agree. I think that that's one of, one of the trade-offs is, the, and this is a broad generalization, but I'll just throw it out there for you to think about. Accepting money from a few big chunks of powerful people tends to constrain the extent to which you can turn around and then share power. Conversely, if you create your organization around power sharing and everybody having input, that's great. You may have to build an organization that fits the size of support you can earn that way. That's not a bad thing. It's just recognizing that you can't independently say, this is exactly the museum we wanna build that's gonna have this many employees and cost this much money to run. And then we're gonna crowdsource the income from people who love us and come to our meetings. That may be a mismatch. So the, the financial model and the museum you're operating have to be in alignment. So Boris Wilkerman um, asks about, do you have any insights or predictions specific to university museums? And I would like to, uh, relate that to today's dispatches from the future of museums. I, if um, attendees do not are not subscribed to dispatches from the future of museums, please do because there's quite a lot of good information and there's a series I believe that you're just starting about academic museums. So this is a quote from uh, Philip Ehrenfeit, the director and associate professor at the Trout Gallery of Dickinson College, who stated. Academic museums are fortunate in that most operate under the aegis of their parent institution, many of which provide a wide range of support, including salary assistance, COVID testing and tracking of staff members, and retrofitting facilities to enable social distancing. Such support is costly, particular at a time, particularly at a time with reduced attendance or none at all. While academic museums face challenges particularly to, particular to the academic environment, many are in a position to better absorb the financial headwinds resulting from the pandemic. So my question, uh, so expanding on Boris's question, is how do you see the impact of financial challenges to higher ed on the academic museums uh, and the academic museums? Um, yes, yes, and that the the. Um... So the newsletter you're referring to, Dispatches from the Future of Museums, you can find a link to subscribe on the Alliance website, the CFM webpage. That story was published on the CFM blog and it is the first in a series I am publishing documenting how campus museums are responding to and adapting to the pandemic. There's some great stories out there. To Philip's point, this is one of those good news, bad news scenarios. The good news is, yay, because of all the things he pointed to, campus museums have been buffered from the immediate short-term impacts of the pandemic. The bad news is higher education already had financial problems before the pandemic that have only been accelerated. I could, that's another half hour talk, but just very briefly, you know, a lot of money was coming from overseas um, foreign exchange students who would pay full freight. They're not coming to the US now. There are already um, concerns about students protesting, even suing museums about whether they should have to pay their full registration fee at a time when they're not getting the full campus experience they signed up for. Um, museums within universities, I have fear, are in long-term risk because 
let's be frank, universities don't exist to run museums. As an example, one of the ongoing struggles on the edges of museums has been about the tendency of some boards to say, well, let's solve our financial problems by selling a work of art, which is against the code of ethics. When that has happened in university museums and people protest and say, this is against the code of ethics of museums, sometimes universities respond, well, that's nice, but we're not a museum, we're a university and we don't exist to run a museum. It's one of our amenities. And if we choose to run it in a way that works financially for us, then tough luck. I'm worried that the pandemic is going to create that effect writ large. Some university museums have robust sources of independent support. They actually do earn a significant amount of their income. They may be taking more of a hit now, but recover more quickly later. Some of them have significant restricted endowments, yay them, that are untouchable, that would make it hard for the, for the university to just come out and eliminate them. But I do think that there are going to be a lot of First of all, there are going to be a lot of small colleges that simply go out of existence. They're going to shut. That's already been happening over the last 10 years. There are going to be more of them going out of business in the coming year or two. And if they're running a museum, they're going to disappear because their parent organization disappears. Even inside colleges and universities that survive, they may be making severe cuts for their own financial sur uh, survival. One of the things Philip referred to, the fact that University museums often in normal times benefit the, from the fact that they're not directly paying a lot of their essential staff. They may be getting security, they may be getting maintenance um, from university staff. A lot of the people who serve as curators may be paid professors, right? If the university is radically cutting staff and payroll, those people are not available to the museum and the museum isn't necessarily gonna have the economic resources to replace them. So I think it's a very serious issue and one that I'm following closely. Thank you. Yuri Zhao asks a question about the constraint model. The chance seems very slim with governments themselves encounter severe, uh, when governments themselves encounter severe fiscal stress. What are some ways to leverage voter support for additional public funding for museums? Well, this is one thing, of course, that we're in the midst of now. Um, I would argue that any civic organization, museums included, uh, has a role and a responsibility to create an, a, an educated and civically engaged public. So one of the things the Alliance is encouraging museums to do is uh, actively engage in voter education, in voter registration. Um, some museums are serving as polling sites. A lot of museums have put up exhibits in the past few years to educate people about specific policy issues. This is a great example of museums thinking about how to intentionally try and shape the future they think is a good future to live in, either for people in general, for themselves as individuals, or for the museum. Any kind of museum, whether it's an art museum, natural history museum, a history museum, there are elements to how they can behave in legal and appropriate ways that help engage people in thinking about important issues of the day and hopefully inspire them to make choices that push us in the right direction. Thank you. Jerry Zhao just ended the phrase severe fiscal stress, and I'd like to link that to um, a controversial topic, the collection as cookie jar, funds from the accessions. So these are two uh, areas that both academic museums and public museums have um, battled with for some time. With Jerry's point about severe fiscal stress, how does that put those two areas of museum professional activity uh, in Profile. Well, um, you may be following the news that the American, the Association of Art Museum Directors, AAMD, took the unprecedented step of um, basically putting a hold on sanctioning museums for contravening certain parts of their standards. So I want to be very careful here because this is a complicated issue that has been consistently misreported in the press. So I will do my best to get it absolutely right. Um, of all of the discipline-specific museum associations, AAMD has the strictest policy regarding deaccessioning. And it says that funds from the sale of deaccessioned works from the collection can only be used for the purchase of new collections. Okay, very straightforward. I will note that the field-wide standard that AAM promulgates 
we always defer to the more specific standards of grow subgroups, but for museums as a whole, the standard is that it can be used for new purchasing new collections or direct care. There's a very long and thoughtful guideline about how to determine what direct care means on the AAM website, and I recommend that to your attention. But back to AMD. Recognizing the severe financial stress that museums are under, they have put a temporary hold on actively sanctioning museums for contravening that standard in specific ways. So they have basically said during this period, we're okay with direct care. So if you are using funds from deaccessioning an artwork toward direct care, we're not gonna turn around and say you're ostracized. So that's, that's one piece of a very complicated issue, but that's the, the heart of it. So I think even AAMD, which has upheld the highest standards for um, ethical and prudent stewardship of collections resources is admitting that these times are so severe that they require some unusual, unprecedented steps in allowing museums to take steps that might allow them to survive. And for, for additional information about um, uh, collections as a cookie jar, I think we do need to look at, to a certain extent, at academic museums and the history of academic museums, because as you pointed out, um, universities and colleges are not in the business of running museums per se, and oftentimes view museum collections differently than does the museum profession. Yeah. Yes. And no, I, I worry. And I would like to note that there is a task force of the Association of Academic um, University museums, and galleries. museums and Galleries mm -hmm. that is looking at that specific issue. issue. Excellent work. And um, I think the field is looking to them for guidance and leadership on how to head off those kinds of action. Great, thank you. Pat Hayes says, thank you so much for your presentation. Well, we all say that. Thank you so much for your presentation. Where does restorative justice uh, fit in with your scenarios and stories? I'm thinking particularly of the ethics of repatriation and reparations to communities whose labor and or cultural patrimony, whether stolen or coercively extracted, has historically generated wealth and repute for museums. Absolutely. First of all, absolutely yes. Museums need to acknowledge that they are products of wealth and privilege that was built through exploitation. And for that reason, if no other, they need to play a part in reparative practice. If I'm gonna beg your indulgence to leap past what I think, excuse me, are the no-brainers of repatriating material that was unethically or illegally appropriated from, from through colonial practices, I know it's a hard one and we're struggling with it, but there seems to be a clear consensus it's the right thing to do. So heading in the right direction there, it's gonna be a long, hard road. I would like to push towards a more complicated and nuanced position that museums can actively and intentionally help reparative practice by building the wealth of people who have been historically exploited. So, this is drawing on the work of someone I admire greatly, Marina Gorbis, who's the director of the Institute for the Future. And Marina has written about the fact that when we look at inequality, economic inequality in the US, it isn't just a matter of income inequality. It's not even just a matter of wealth inequality, um, which as measured by financial resources, I think the figure is that the average black family in America has one tenth, tenth the wealth of the average white family. It's inequality in terms of the assets that even allow you to build that wealth, right? It's inequality of access to education, to decent housing, to clean air, towards social connections, to opportunities to um, build your own economic sources of activity. That's an area where I think museums can play a very profound reparative role because even museums that don't have a lot of money have power. They have reputation. They have reach. They have influence. They have trust. And by putting those resources, whether they're tangible or intangible, in the service of people who have been historically disadvantaged, they can help those communities build their assets and therefore build their wealth. So, for example, saying to local artists, 
what can we do to promote your work? How can we make sure that you have the opportunities that your predecessors who were black artists or people of color or women who were ignored by the mainstream establishment and therefore weren't the famous artists whose works brought a lot of money in the marketplace. How can we elevate you? And yeah, we want to elevate the value of your work. We're not pretending we're divorced from the market. We're going to try and equitably make sure that people who have been formally excluded from the sanctioned canon are now brought in and have an opportunity to schmooze with our trustees and use our connections to build their own reputations and businesses and make sure that local schools, which are inequitably funded, that we're disproportionately paying attention to how we can provide educational resources to kids who are not being well served. So for me, it's a very broad and balanced approach of museums being conscious of how much power they really have and putting in service of society rebuilding equity. Great, thank you. I just want to remind uh, attendees, please do type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will get, we have uh, time to get to all your questions, so I really appreciate, and I really appreciate your, uh, your thoughtful questions. From Jennifer Gunn, one of our hosts, um, are there logical community partner organizations who might collectively address the future? I'm thinking about public libraries, health departments, civic organizations, etc. Yes, yes. <laughs> the thing that I hesitate about is the list is so broad, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, let me give you just two examples. So one relatively new museum that I uh, admire an, uh, immensely is the Dignity Museum, which started in Atlanta um, about two years ago. And if, for now, its home is in a shipping container, which is kind of appropriate because the Dignity Museum is about bringing voice and power to people who are experiencing homelessness. Its parent organization is a organization called Love Beyond Walls, who, that exists to advocate for the rights and needs of people experiencing homelessness. And they are finding partners all over the country and around the world to work with them on that particular issue. All right. One of the things I'm finding in the pandemic is a lot of museums creating um, very strong partnerships with groups that exist to alleviate hunger. So they're giving up their space to serve as distribution points to food pantries, or they have land or even historic gar gardens. And they're saying, let's grow food because we need to direct more produce to give away during the pandemic when the needs um, for food relief are so great. Another example, local schools. Uh, I'm going to be publishing soon a story of the Louisiana Children's Museum, which has to be closed for COVID reasons. And instead of just leaving the building vacant, they went to a funder and a local school, a, a, a low income school of disadvantaged, serving disadvantaged children and said, you know, you're having trouble figuring out how to operate under COVID restrictions and having appropriate distancing for the kids, use our building. Have some of your kids come over and use the museum's building as their school and spread out as much as you need to. So those are three examples there, organizations that are serving people experiencing homelessness, uh, organizations trying to alleviate hunger and schools that are serving low-income communities that are all great partners. So the list goes on and on. I think it's a matter of museums looking at the needs in their community, finding the people who are already effectively serving those needs, and then asking how could we help? How could we par be part of that larger structure or mechanism? Great, thank you. Will Haugen asks, is there data that would suggest that the museums that are less reliant on programs tied to their collections, i.e. more program forward, are likely to become more resilient financially? Am I going to say flip if I just say no? I, I'm not saying that there is data that shows that that isn't true. I just know of no data that speaks to that point. So anybody out there looking for a research project for your graduate thesis, that would be an awesome one. There we go. Okay. Um, what might be the projected impact of the 2020 census on uh, museum funding? Whoa, deep, complicated, above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm just going to take a pass on that by saying the, the complexities of how the census determines local funding 
and how federal funding flows is, is so complicated, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, I will, however, it's a little late to do anything about it now, but I will just reiterate how important it is that any census be accurate and note how many challenges the census has faced this year, even before the pandemic. So I'm very concerned about that. Thank you. Well, above your pay grade, that is certainly a, a valid answer. Um, an anonymous attendee writes, it seems these models present significant consequences for the generation of young adults wanting to train for museum professions now, which is, of course, the focus of this collaborative. Can you comment on how this might affect them and how it might affect that interest overall now and in the coming years? Well, yes. This is another whole hour that we can spend together or more. I think what I'm going to do is, is just give you some observations based on the 10 years I've spent running CFM, during which time I often have the opportunity to speak at universities and I always try and sit down and talk to people in the museum studies classes and ask them what their concerns are and listen to what their thoughts are about museum careers. And I think that the sad news, just based on those observations, is many of the people I meet have built a concept of the museum career they want that lived in a museum that existed 50 years ago, if not 100 years ago. And they're wonderful jobs, and they were awesome while they lasted. And they're still going to exist. I mean, we still have people who shoe horses. It's a job. There just aren't as many of them. And I think what we're going to see in the future is there may be, relatively speaking, a smaller niche for people who had traditional scholarly jobs that used to be considered as the core of museum work, whether that's being a curator, right, or a researcher. Because museums to survive in the next few years are really going to have to double down on having people who can help their bottom line, whether that's people who are helping their bottom line by helping them focus on the community. And we're seeing a rise of people who are like directors of community engagement. They're actually hired to help the museum understand who they're serving and build those relations that result in relational economic support. Or whether it's people who are expert in digital and can figure out how to do data analytics in a sophisticated way. Uh, or people who are just really good at business. Not many people that I have met have gone into museum studies saying, I want to be a business manager and I just want to apply it in a museum. So I think the challenge is finding a way to really accurately look at what museums are doing and the people they need and find a good fit for what you want to do that satisfies whatever it is you're looking for in a museum job but is a close enough match that you're not going to be unhappy having slotted yourself into a hole that doesn't really fit. In a recent uh, Washington Post article, um, LA County Museum of Art director Michael Govan predicted that museums are undergoing a lasting change. So he comes down somewhere between your uh, business as usual and collapse model. And he says, this is a permanent inflection point. We will never go back to the way it was. You mentioned uh, the layoff of up to 44% of um, museums, uh, up to 44% of museums laid off staff nationally. And many of those uh, staff members were educators. Does this, does this give us a sense that perhaps uh, there is a, a free equity, excellence and equity time ahead for museums that education is going to occupy, a, you know, coming from an academic setting. Does, do you see that this might uh, indicate that education will occupy a different role within museums? I'm going to beg your indulgence while I back up and take a long run at this that may not at first seem obvious. All right. And uh, what I'm going to do first is point to a different sector, which is journalism and newspapers. And of course, journalism has floundered for over a decade because their economic model is collapsing. And the reason their economic model collapsed is because the core of what they did was journalism. It was writing stories, right? And I think the highest and best core of that was investigative 
journalism that really looked for high quality research into facts. They made their money from advertising, okay? So basically, they taught people that their content was, if not free, relatively cheap because the money was coming from advertising. And as soon as we saw the rise of digital advertising and all of these other platforms where companies could do a better and cheaper job of attracting clients, the advertising revenue for journalism collapsed. And now you're seeing mainstream press after mainstream press going over, getting, going under, getting bought up. Um, now you have journalism struggling to think, should we reinvent ourselves as nonprofits? Hashtag irony. You know, how are we going to support journalism? Because we never built an economic model around the core of what we did. This is the transition I'm making. When you go back to that income mix that I showed you, it wasn't as clear cut as the journalism model, but I would argue overall we were doing something similar. The intellectual core of what museums do, in part, is preservation and collecting. Try this at a, at a cocktail party. Ask people who have nothing to do with museums if they have any guess how many objects museums own that aren't on display. They will be shocked, shocked when you tell them that for most museums, 90 to 98% of what they own is not on display. They don't even know about it, much know that they're supporting it with the money they spend, okay? So collections research, scholarship, to a large extent, education. Those are things that museums have done as a core purpose, but they've earned the money on the side in all sorts of ways. So I agree with Michael to the extent that as those side forms of income are disrupted, museums suddenly are leaving those core purposes very vulnerable unless they've found a way to build income streams around them. Now, sometimes they have. So for example, the San Diego Museum of Natural History is unprecedented in my experience in natural history museums that have research collections because they have built such a robust income stream around contract services, biological services, working for government agencies or firms that need things identified or surveyed or you know summary research reports that they actually support their collections and research work through the directly associated expertise. That's an anomaly. So what we're gonna be seeing in coming years is either museums trying to get mon better at monetizing the core of what they do, like education, which then has a challenge of how do you do it in a way that remains equitable and accessible, or finding other income streams to prop up and direct the profits over to support what we really exist to do. Oh, can't hear you. Very yeah. good. Yep, yep. Thank you. Um, I, I believe we're, we're coming to the end of the questions. Um, and if anyone has an, uh, a last question for Elizabeth, we're going to um, be wrapping up soon. Elizabeth, I just wanted last last thing was um, really something towards uh, around the notion of um, citizen museology, which is a very interesting topic. And I think that that kind of a topic really gives us um, a lot to think about in terms of how that how that engages community in a new way. Um, it also allows us to think about uh, donors who are looking to make a difference with their donation and how uh, both volunteering and donating could, could come together. Um, you spoke just a little bit about donors with sort of social justice or environmental um, uh, sustainability. Uh, do you see that interacting with uh, the citizen museology uh, model uh, that would be actually a very sustainable uh, direction for museums to look at? Well, t two comments on that, if I understand where you're coming from. First of all, one thing museums and I'm basing this on, on reports and research I've read, so this isn't a personal observation. Uh, museums often make the mistake of not realizing that their donors, that their volunteers can also be donors. So they often will have a database of these are our donors and these are our members and we will ask these people for money. Not realizing that the people who care enough to give their time, which in often, is often is a very scarce resource, probably care enough to give money too when they are able to. So I think that to go back to those relational economies, 
museums that have very robust volunteer support um, and, and give volunteers significant authority and voice and meaningful work are going to find that there is financial support that comes with that too. The second observation is a, is a little more concerning, which is um, absolutely there are a lot of philanthropic individuals who are very focused on social justice, environmental justice. The challenge for museums is we have to convince these people that we are effective agents of change in those areas because there are many other causes they can give to that seem to have a much more direct relationship and a more promising result for their money than, you know, you should give money to museums because we will help combat climate change. I believe we can, but we have to make a better, do a better job of making that case. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for your talk and for all your time and your, your ideas um, with, the que with questions. Uh, we really value your look into the future and uh, give us a lot to think about. It was my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity and for the wonderful questions. So I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer to wrap us, to bring us home. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you, Elizabeth. It really was a wonderful talk, and I appreciated the range of scenarios, which really, I think, had some useful ideas for all of us and not just a, a sort of uh, firm grasp of the obvious that we, we are facing a lot of challenges. So thank you so much. Thank you to the Preparing um, for the Future of Museums Collaborative and Abby Travis, the IAS uh, uh, tech master, shall we say, um, and particularly thank all of you for coming, and I hope we'll see you again next week for Dr. Valerie Hudson. Take care. <laughs>